This podcast is sponsored by Podbeam. Podbeam is the easiest way to create your own podcast. We use Podbeam to host the Classic Gaming Brothers. Download the free Podbeam podcast app to start, record, and publish your very own podcast in just minutes. Podbeam provides everything you need to run your podcast, and you can record and publish episodes directly from the app on your phone. Download the free Podbeam app today. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N. Head on over to Podbeam at www.podbeam.com and use the code PODCAST21 for your first 30 days of podcast hosting for free. Check it out. Welcome to another episode of Classic Gaming Brothers. I'm Seth. And I'm Zach. And we are the Classic Gaming Brothers. We are the Classic Gaming Brothers. That's right. And welcome to part two of our two-part series. Yeah. It is part two, but it is also not part two, since Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask are two entirely separate games. Yes. Yeah, they are entirely separate games. but they you can are... And you can enjoy them independently. By the way, Seth, before we go into more about the games, congratulations on getting married, because this episode is coming out the weekend after you're married. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I'm I'm definitely around and not in California. You are definitely around and not in California, uh, which is why if this episode is edited poorly, it's not Seth's fault. <laughs> That's right. Congratulations on moving out. Thank you. I have moved out. Still near our fair city. It'll be commuting to the office easier. Yeah. Theoretically. <laughs> well, our theoretical office. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, well, big life events have happened. Yeah, huge life events. And then, um, yeah, so this is going to be our, <laughs> our, our 92nd episode, but First, before we get in back into Legends of Zelda, we are going to talk about things that we've recently been playing. Whoa. So since I was just married, I'm going to go second. You can go first. That sounds fair. Recently, Seth, I have been playing Super Baseball 2020. This is a game that came out in 1991, not in 2020, <laughs> and is... Uh, it was originally released in the arcade by SNK, but it was then uh, later ported over to the Genesis and the Super Nintendo. The Super Nintendo version was created by a company called Monolith, and SNK published it on the Super Nintendo. It's a very weird game. It's a baseball game, that's for sure, but you play as robots, like all robots, everyone's a robot, and there's weird super robot technology stuff like teleporting. It's still kind of just a generic baseball game, though. Like, the robots don't do anything special because they're robots. They are just robots. <laughs> like, the, the robots don't like use their teleporting powers or anything to be better at baseball no they're just robots i suck at it because i'm just bad at baseball games but i also think that the emulation because to be fair i was playing the game through an emulator but i think the emulation might have been a little like bugged or something because i would swing the bat and sometimes it just wouldn't swing yeah it was very it was obnoxious i think that's where your pain points with emulation come into play with games that require some kind of precise hitting especially like beat em up games and fighting yeah, games yeah. but also i can be sports game as well which is why hardware emulation is the way that's ideal which uh maybe if i get a copy of the game i can play it on my uh i technically don't have a og super nintendo but i have a hardware clone so i could technically play it on the hardware clone nice have you played uh ken griffin jr no i haven't yes i should that is probably one of the better baseball games however i i do like that a game that came out in 1991 called super baseball 2020 is now 2021 at the time of this recording and there are no robots playing baseball however we did have holograms in the stands which is kind of adjacent to robots that's true well it's actually fun i actually think today our recently played games are fun in that their own rights that you played a game we're playing a game that came out in 1991 and was taking place in 2020 and i was playing a game that came out in the 2020s 
that takes place in the 1990s. <laughs> so I was playing a game called Hypnospace Outlaw, which was developed by Tendershoot, Michael Lash, and That Which Is Media, and published by No More Robots. And in it, you play essentially a 1990s virtual reality cop working for a company that runs the virtual reality, and you are working to censor things that do not comply by the rules of the hypnospace world. Okay. So hypnospace is a virtual reality, but it's like if virtual reality came out in the 1990s and was essentially like populated by Angel Fire and GeoCity websites. Ooh. So you scroll around to the various people's websites, which are somehow vaguely being so everybody's wearing like some sort of device over their face but everything that they interact with is like a 2d function it's it's a weird experience <laughs> and i 100 percent recommend it you don't actually experience like seeing yourself with the thing on your face you just experience the programs but i am obsessed with the tutorial because it's done like a old school 3d program where you're like exploring an office and you go through and you have like a robot talk to you and explain to you how the different aspects of the game work and oh, it's so good i really enjoy the game a lot you go to different people's websites and like music will play like myspace as it used to be and oh that's fun yeah i you it would be definitely a game up your alley i definitely recommend it um if you have seen the game hypnospace outlaw around and you were have, you were like Oh, that is a weird game. I am afraid of that. Don't be. It's good. It's just, it's really good. I recommend it 100%. Uh, and you go around and protect the hypnospace people from people being profane or abusive to people, which is, I guess, a, a noble thing to do. Yeah. Uh, anyway, time to talk about Majora's Mask, which is the sequel to Ocarina of Time. And I think this is the first time that we're talking about a game that's a sequel after the game that we talked about the prequel. Yes, it is, because usually we talk about the sequel game first, because the Seth and Zach tradition is we had sequels first before we had the originals. Anyway, today we are talking about Majora's Mask, the sequel to Ocarina of Time, and we'll get into memories again. We did that with uh, Ocarina of Time, and we'll get into it with this one. In terms of my memories, I'll go first, I don't mind. My memories are kind of the same as Ocarina of Time. Uh, I had a collector set that came with the GameCube. It had a copy of Ocarina of Time in the set, as well as a copy of Majora's Mask, as well as a copy of Zelda 1 and 2. So I got a chance to play all of those on the GameCube. I still don't own a copy of Majora's Mask OG, like N64 copy for my N64, which is sad. But in terms of my memories of the game, I, I remember liking it. I haven't actually played through... I don't think I've actually beaten it. What I remember about it is that, A, it's a very creepy game. It used to make me feel very scared. And B, there is a time and that gave me anxiety so yeah. i was like there's a timer in this game don't like that uh, but thankfully you can kind of like subvert that because you learn a time travel thing but still i yeah i also don't like timers in video games i actually started playing stardew valley again because stardew valley is very chill when it comes to time in regards to like you need like it doesn't feel like there's a time there's like certain instances that happen at certain things and like you have to like do the thing in two years or whatever but you don't really have to you could just like chill yeah and i kind of like that kind of passive uh just chill i like that type of game that can sometimes relax because to zach's point I, I think we have like anxiety driven game timers which majora's mask uh, does induce a little bit of anxiety things that i remember is when link would put on a mask and he would scream like he would scream out in pain as he put on a mask and then he would become like a Deku or a um uh, I don't know what else he could shift into he like, could turn into a Zora oh a Goron or Zora yeah 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 yeah. so he, when you when you shift into things he like screams and it's just like terrifying and he has like that zoomed in face of mm. him like becoming a Deku and the creepy guy who played the accordion that or not the accordion the like the little oh yeah like the the old yeah I know what you're talking about what do you what is what do you call that like the guy you learned the song of the song of storms from oh, the windmill guy yeah he who has a phonogram which he cranks yes and 
um, music comes out of it. I don't think you learn the song from him, though, in Majora's Mask. Yes, he does not teach it. He does give you a gift of a mask, though. Well, anyway, those, my memories are of Guru Guru playing his phonograph very quickly, and then the mask salesman, who is also very creepy. The whole game is creepy. There, there's a lot of creepy people in Majora's Mask. Yeah. So now, Majora's Mask, to get into the game itself, since a lot of our memories... I do, I do remember playing Majora's Mask at a friend's house who was not the friend who had Ocarina of Time, but only playing it briefly, and then I emulated most of it. However, so Majora's Mask is, is kind of an interesting diversion in the Legend of Zelda game history. While development between Link's Awakening in 1993 and Ocarina of Time was around five years, Majora's Mask only took a year, mostly because the game engine and the graphics were already done. They were happy with what they got in Ocarina of Time, so they just recycled a lot of the game assets, including characters such as Guru Guru, in from Ocarina of Time into Majora's Mask. Mm. And it made sense, right? The game was a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time and took place in the same world. So it would make sense that in canon, the same people would be around uh, unless they were dead, which then I guess they didn't show up. But I, I, I'm pretty sure there are a bunch of characters that repeat from Ocarina of Time into Majora's Mask. Yes. Now, uh, the game was developed by Eiji Aonuma, Shigeru Miyamoto, and Yoshiaki Kozumi. Aonuma stated that since the game's development initially faced the question, how do you make a sequel to Ocarina of Time? Because Ocarina of Time was very successful and sold upwards of 7 million units. How do you follow that up? It's very hard to follow up a swan song like Ocarina of Time. It'd be like making a sequel to Mad Men or something like that. I don't know why I just went to Mad Men, but like... <laughs> Like, be, like, Don Draper can't make a sequel to Mad, Mad Men. He is Don Draper, right? <laughs> or Don Draper, Don Ham. John Ham can't make a sequel. <laughs> well, Don Draper can't do it either. So the solution that they came up with tied into the overall storyline and the unique addition of the gameplay of Majora's Mask, which we'll talk about when we talk about the gameplay of Majora's Mask. Similar to Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask was intended to be developed for the N64 DD, or the disk drive. Now, for those who did not listen to the last episode, the disk drive was not where the N64 was going to have a CD drive. It was where the N64 would get a proprietary floppy disk drive. So it would not be neither a three and a half nor a five and a quarter disc it would be its own size diskette as it yeah, were it's... it was not really a disc it was more of like a diskette yes yeah and the the 64 dd again for those who didn't listen to the previous episode was a failed add-on to the n64 that had actually been in development since the beginning of the n64 but was released very late and sold terribly in japan and only released in japan now the game itself um, likely started out as what was going to be called Ura Zelda, Ura roughly translating to hidden. The plan for Ura Zelda was to make a more difficult version of Ocarina of Time, which we would later get as Master Quest on the GameCube, though it's been widely stated that Master Quest is not Ura Zelda. Ura Zelda is something entirely different that was cancelled, Master Quest is its own thing. What is interesting is that Miyamoto really didn't want to release an entirely new Zelda so soon after Ocarina of Time. He really just wanted to make a version that he had initially envisioned as this harder version of Ocarina of Time. He he wanted to make what was essentially the second quest. So in the original Legend of Zelda, when you beat the game, you access the second quest, which is the whole game, just this time, a lot harder. And he wanted that for Ocarina of Time. However, the game's design ended up falling on Eiji Aonuma, and Aonuma had created the dungeons for Ocarina of Time, and he did not want to make the same dungeons again. Even though he would be remixing these dungeons, he just, like, just could not get into it. So he actually told Miyamoto that he would develop the game entirely in one year, and Miyamoto was like, all right, and thus the game development did begin. Though what's interesting is the story kind of comes from two different places. So there's one story that Miyamoto asked Ayanuma to develop this game because Ayanuma was having trouble remixing these dungeons. And Miyamoto was like, listen, if you make a new Zelda game in one year using the assets we have, I will not make you remix Ocarina of Time. There's another story that Miyamoto came to Ayanuma and was like, you don't want to do this? And he was like, yeah, can I like try something new? And Miyamoto was like, all right, you have a year. But um, either way, development began from that point. The game that Aonuma would develop, Zelda Gaiden, would be announced by Nintendo 
and was demoed at the Nintendo Space World Exposition on August 27th, 1999. The early demo had some elements that would be familiar to any Majora Mask fan. A large clock tower in the main town, a timer, a mask system, and some of the storyline details. Uh, Miyamoto would go on to say that Zelda Gaiden was different from Ura Zelda and would be a unique title. The game would eventually be released worldwide as The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Unlike Ocarina of Time, the game requires the N64 4 megabyte expansion pack, making it one of the few games that require the pack to actually work. The other game that required it was Donkey Kong 64. Yes. This is likely due to the fact that the game makes use of more detailed texture mapping and animation, more accurate dynamic lighting, and greater draw distances, and more characters are able to be displayed on the screen of Majora's Mask than they were in Ocarina of Time. Another technical difference is that the building interiors are rendered in real time rather than the fixed 3D displays which Ocarina made use of, which was the reason why the camera would be fixed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> fixed 3d displays essentially you had a sprite that just ran into like a painting versus being rendered in real time also you could see that when you're in majora's mask and you're entering like the windmill you can move around the camera yeah and examine it and versus just seeing a stock image of the windmill i actually think this was good since it was a sequel to ocarina of time so there were some improvements to the game which it need you know you should always improve a product when you go and release it again. Uh, even if you did change the story and make it a new game entirely, you should update the graphics and stuff like that. Majora's Mask is very similar to Ocarina of Time. Uh, I mean, it's a sequel built in the same engine. As one could expect, some of the gameplay is probably going to be nearly identical. In terms of the actual story, the game takes place in a potential future for Link's character from the end of Ocarina of Time. The reason I say potential future is because Zelda has a split timeline zelda actually has a timeline that's like like marvel comics level of like divergence so at the end of ocarina of time there is three potential possibilities link gets sent back in time and the events of majora's mask takes place link gets sent back in time and the future occurs without link because he's missing in time and that's technically a separate timeline and then there's also a timeline where link dies so if link dies that creates a timeline that is separate from majora's mask is there a game that plays in the timeline that link is dead i think that's the hold on there's there's the, this i'm gonna look up the zelda timeline okay so here's the timeline ready at the end of ocarina of time if link dies then Hyrule falls to Ganon. There is a war that occurs, and the events of Link to the Past later take place. Something that's explained in, like, the visual diaries is that link is actually a reincarnated hero so there's always like a link there's always a link there's always a zelda there's always a ganon kind of like bioshock if if link dies then the events of link to the past oracle of seasons oracle of ages link's awakening and the original legend of zelda and legend of zelda 2 take place this is if, if link dies in ocarina of time. if link dies in ocarina of time if link okay. survives in ocarina of time then he gets sent back in time in the events of Majora's Mask take place. This leads into right. the events of Twilight Princess, where what happens is Link essentially becomes this figure who, as he gets older, doesn't go on adventures anymore and becomes kind of like annoyed that people don't know that he saved the world. So, like Luke? Yeah. So he becomes like... <laughs> like bitter and angry and he eventually dies and you encounter his spirit in twilight princess that's if you win and you go back to majora's mask and after you beat majora's mask you become a grumpy old man who dies yes and then the other one is you die and you get reincarnated and you play through the original zelda games yes and then there's a third timeline where yes. the third timeline occurs during a period where Link is sent back in time, but there is no Link in the future. Right. And this period creates the Wind Waker time period. Ah. Where Ganondorf is sealed away, but then he gets revived, and then all of Hyrule gets flooded by the gods, and then Wind Waker happens. Which one's Breath of the Wild off of? That's a very good question. People don't really know. <laughs> this timeline so, was like established before Breath of the Wild, but it's the official timeline from Nintendo. Perfect. Do you start with Zelda? the one or do you start with <laughs> ocarina oh no time? no the first game you play is skyward sword <laughs> oh, okay. then you play minish cap then four swords 
then okay. Ocarina of Time. Okay, and then depending on how you beat Ocarina of Time sends you down your corresponding path Correct. of games to play. So if you die at any point in Ocarina of Time, stop playing you, the game. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Go dust off your Super Nintendo. Go get a link to the past. Pop that in. Play through all of Link to the Past. Play through all Core of Seasons, Oracle of Ages, Link's Awakening, blah blah blah. And then play the original Legend of Zelda. <laughs> and yep, and Adventure Zelda 2. And then do you go back to Ocarina of Time? Yeah, then you go back to Ocarina of Time, you see if you can not die this time. If you do die again, you have to repeat the process. And you just have yep, to keep you doing have to continue this. To every play. single yep. time Link dies. That's how you play that's the, the only true way to play. And Zelda. then I would say if you win. Just roll a dice, like or, or like flip yeah. a coin, flip a coin. Heads, you you follow Link's journey as he stays a child, grows old and bitter, and then gets reincarnated in Twilight Princess, or uh, you you do the future without Link, and you are lost in time, and you play Wind Waker. Yes, right, and then and then Link gets reincarnated, of course, because Link always gets reincarnated. It's just you know that's because that's Link, right? Sometimes just weird. The world graphically changes around Link. <laughs> Sometimes he's cel shaded. Yeah, I think the modern interpretation of the timeline is that at some point after all of the games before Breath of the Wild, the timelines converge, and Breath of the Wild takes place somewhere in the converged timeline. Like I said, it's like as complicated as Marvel. Anyway, in this version of the game, so in this timeline, Link has been sent back in time after the defeat of Ganon to live out his childhood. So Zelda's like, "Hey, uh, you kind of got screwed over because you went." from being a little child to being an adult man um why don't you go have an actual life and revel in the fact that you saved the world so link gets sent back in time and it goes on a quick quest to go find navi because navi goes missing on his quest he encounters the mysterious skull kid who appears in ocarina of time a uh, skull kid is this kind of mysterious wood spirit who kind of just is annoying in this though he ambushes you forces a mask on you and the mask turns you into a defenseless deku shrub the deku shrubs are um common enemies that you find in ocarina of time but now you are one when you become the deku shrub you're actually unable to initially remove the mask so you have to kind of play through part of the game as a deku shrub which like you don't have a sword and you don't really have a defense uh you can spin <laughs> and you can kind of fly not really fly but you can like glide which is kind of cool i guess you then meet a creepy mask man and he does stuff with masks and then i think you eventually get your mask removed and after that you soon learn that there's a great disaster that's going to occur in three days and you're required later in the game to use time travel to complete your quest and stop the devastation now as noted there are some substantial differences from ocarina of time in terms of the gameplay mechanics for one thing time travel is now a mechanic you do have to make use of time travel in order to make sure that you don't run out the clock and end the world and you are required to beat this game within the three days and these days move by fast because these aren't like it's not like real time though now you're dealing with a time loop so if you go back to the beginning of the first day events of the first day play out pretty much the same so you have to make sure you do certain things in the first day if you want them to have an impact on the second day there is some like calculation going on in in your head when you are doing this game there is also the mask system so the mask system is unique to this game um you can put on various masks to take different forms so you have the deku shrub that you become at the beginning of the game but you can also get a goron mask that turns you into a goron which are these rock creatures you can then wear a zora mask that allows you to swim and there's a couple other masks i believe that you can use throughout the game as a fun fact zelda is not in this game despite the fact that it is called the legend of zelda sometimes it's the legend of zelda with out of Zelda, but there's always a link. There's always or a link. Not. So how did Majora's Mask do? Well, the game did well. Not as well as Ocarina of Time. However, on release in Japan, April of 2000, around 314,000 copies would be sold. The game would be released later in October for North America. Ultimately, 3.36 million copies would be sold worldwide, which is 4.5 million short to Ocarina. The game received very strong praise, with a majority of magazines giving it a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. One criticism was the game ultimately wasn't as accessible as Ocarina of Time was for new players, and overall may take some players longer to get into it than others, which is a fair criticism. I think that Majora's Mask can 
can be quite intimidating to play versus Ocarina of Time, which kind of leads you into a, like a slow ramp up. And Ocarina of Time just feels like there's plenty of time to do everything. Uh, Majora's Mask, even though there, there is a timer and you do have the ability to time loop, uh, it still feels like it's still compressed. Yeah, Ocarina of Time also is really set up for new players. So the whole opening of the game is exposition. Uh, you learn about Hyrule, you learn about the three goddesses, you learn about the Triforce, you learn about how the Triforce kind of embodies courage, wisdom, and power, and you learn about Link, Zelda, and Ganondorf. You don't learn those in Majora's Mask. It literally begins with you as young Link traveling with Epona through the woods, and there's no exposition for why you're there, really who you are, what's going on. <laughs> um, so if you're not familiar with Ocarina of Time, it may take you off guard as like, what, what, what why am I doing this? What's, yeah. what's this? It's, it's definitely a sequel and a game that really needs Ocarina of Time to stand up um, in regards to at least the story. The game has been ported over to the GameCube in 2003. And it was part of the collector's edition set, which Zachary owns. Uh, it was also released on the Wii's virtual console in 2009. And a 3DS remake was released in 2015. Game also inspired the popular creepy pasta ARPG Ben Drowned, which we actually talked about in our Urban Legends episode back in episode 46. So if you haven't heard that episode, go ahead and after this episode wraps up, head on back to the archives and pick up episode 46, our Urban Legends episode, and take a listen to that as we talk about different creepypastas and Urban Legends related to video games. It's a fun episode. Yeah. We talk about Ben Drowned. Speaking of Ben Drowned, as just kind of a random thought I wanted to dwell on, is Majora's Mask is just really creepy. I was thinking about this more as I was writing notes for this episode and i was listening to some of the music for majora's mask and it is just sad sounding i was listening to the theme song like the theme of the game and it's very depressing sounding it just sounds melancholy and there are a lot of dark elements to the game it, really from the very get-go i mean you start out as link in this dark forest as you are all alone without your friend navi and you get attacked in the opening scene. You know, it's like you are down on your luck and you are beaten when you are down. There's also just dark tones in the level. I mean, both thematically and even literally with the colors and the lighting. Uh, I mean, for one thing, spoiler alert, there's a part of the game where the moon is coming to destroy the world. And it's this creepy, disturbing moon that is like barrowing down on you the entire game and there's just some disturbing implications in some of the dialogue as people are coming to learn that they are going to die so for example one point in the game you encounter a type of milk being sold through a milk bar that has an inebriating effect on characters one character in fact named gorman who is actually friends with guru guru the man from the the windmill gorman overindulges on milk and ends up behaving incredibly drunk and uh he does this because he finds finds out that this theater troupe show is being canceled. Now, in a later part of the game, as the world is about to end, you see a character giving her young sister this exact milk, this inebriating milk, because the world is ending. There's no point in not giving it to them anymore. It's like this little girl's always been saying, I want to drink this milk, and the older sister's saying, oh no, you have to wait till you're an adult. It's kind of a dark implication for a children's game rated E. You know, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. It's this kind of weird thing. I think that's kind Kind of what makes Majora's Mask really perfect for things like Creepypasta is because it is a creepy game. And, and, you know, I think it has this kind of reputation as being kind of the scary Zelda almost. You know, everyone I've talked to who plays it remembers it being kind of creepy in certain parts of the game. Um, and, and it is. Um, it's just a random thought I have. I don't know how much, uh, you know, how much it is to dwell on, um, but it is uh, interesting, I think, that th that it went that route. And, and the games really haven't done that since then, uh, though Twilight Princess does get a little weird in some parts. Yeah, it's a weird game, but uh, it's a good game. It is a good Majora's game. Majora's Mask is really fun. It is it does feel a little compressed, but it is uh, if you if you liked Ocarina of Time, you'll like Majora's Mask for 
being one year in production, they did a phenomenal job with the game. The story is tight, and it's an overall great experience going through it. So that's going to be our Legends of Zelda Majora's Mask or Legends of Zelda two-parter there that's going to be the end of that particular content Uh, we're going to get into our byway pass and then we'll close out this episode so for my byway pass i'm going to talk about patron which is being developed and published by overseer games it is a survival city builder that's actually introducing some social dynamics into its whole system so you do the standard city building stuff where you gather uh, resources and use resources in like a chain a supply chain to take wood and turn into lumber and put lumber to build buildings and so on and so forth and you build up your village into a prosperous city however it adds in some social dynamics where not everyone's going to like what your patron who's the one who's running the city it wants to do so some citizens might like immigration others might not like immigration so you have to kind of walk that line and make sure that you keep your citizens happy using different political mechanics as well as uh, your traditional city building mechanics so it's an interesting games it looks kind of cool i like city builders i'm gonna put this down as a wait as i ultimately am not in the mood to play a city builder right now but uh, if that itch comes around, which it usually does, maybe I'll uh, pick this game up. So that's Patron by Overseer Games. Exciting. What about you, Zachadu? The game I'm excited about by waiting or passing on is Fatal Frame Maiden of Black Water. This is due out in October. October of 2021, October 28th is the date given. It's a remaster of the fifth game in the Fatal Frame series, which is kind of a unique series. So Fatal Frame is a survival horror game, but it's also a photography game. You walk around and you take photos of spooky ghosts. So uh, the idea of the game is you kind of fight these ghosts by taking their picture and you explore spooky places and take photos. And it looks cool. I, I haven't really played much of the original Fatal Frame games, but I'm interested in picking this one up. So I might actually put this down as a wait, but close to a buy. It's going to be available on Switch, PS4, PS5, and other systems. I might try to try out the earlier Fatal Frame games first before I pick this one up, but this one in particular does look very cool. Um, Just the idea that they are remastering it for modern systems sounds fun. So I'll put it down as a wait on the edge of a buy. Being it's very close to October when this game is coming out, I think it could be cool to play maybe for Halloween, maybe do a Halloween stream with it if I do end up picking it up. So uh, I will put it down as a way by. Anyway, thanks for getting to the end of the episode. There's a couple of things that we want to tell you about us. And those things are how to listen to us, contact us and support us. So in order to listen to us, you've already done that. So you've gotten to this part of the episode, which is usually pretty deep in the episode. So great. Thanks for joining us here. You know how to listen to us. We are also on other listening applications such as Stitcher, Spotify and iTunes. If you want to listen to us on our website, You can go to it at ClassicGamingBrothers.com, and on that website, you can go to our contact form, and you can fill that out, and you can that sends us an email. You can also just email us at ClassicGamingBrothers at gmail.com. You can also contact us by following us on social media. We have a Facebook, an Instagram, a Twitch, a Twitter, I think that's it. So our Facebook and our Instagram and our Twitch are all at ClassicGamingBrothers, with Twitch being twitch.tv slash ClassicGamingBrothers. Our Twitter is CG Brothers Pod. And throughout all our social medias, we announce whenever our episodes drop and if we drop any additional episode content, which just so everybody knows is Sunday is when we drop our new episodes. And we have dropped a new episode for almost two years of dropping episodes every Sunday. Wow. So there's that. And to support us, there's a couple of ways to support us. First, listen to us. That's great. We always like it when you come back and listen for more. Two, you can support us by rating us on iTunes. Giving us a rating on iTunes really helps with the numbers, and we always appreciate more numbers because more numbers means that more people listen, and more people listens make Zachary happy. Um, And there's that. So that's how you can listen to us, contact us, and support us. I think I got everything. Did I miss anything? Yeah, that's everything. All right, I'm going to see. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Don't play games like my brother. And don't play games like my brother. I've been Zach. And I've been Seth. We've been the Classic Gaming Brothers. Uh, That's that's right. right.